our first session of the afternoon, uh, which I'll be chairing because Kurvis needs to chair the second one, in which both Nkosanati and I are presenting. But we have three uh, papers being presented. We have uh, our first one is uh, Gillian Rennie and Anthea Garman who are presenting together. Um, they are both based in the, uh, the, the School of Media and Journalism, am I correct? Uh, at, at Rhodes. Yes, it is. The, yeah, the School of Journalism and Media Studies at Rhodes. And both particularly interested in um, various modes of writing, other modes of writing. Um, and they are presenting a piece, a collaborative piece called Cancer Came on a Monday. So I'll pass up to the two of you. Thank you so much and good afternoon everybody. Ten years ago I had a mastectomy. At the same time my sister was dying of lymphoma so my opting for radical surgery seemed like the most decisive response for a family already reeling in cancer's brutal wake. Coping emotionally on behalf of us all also seemed like a helpful response. Publicly I made light of my breast removal. For my friends, however, coping with this challenge to my mortality asked of them something else. Anthea started emailing me, finding she could say things on her screen that evaded her in person. In response, I too wrote what I failed to say out loud. Like opened both us and the subject matter in unexpected ways. Since then, we have edited the emails into an epistolary poem, but it has not yet found a public home. Additionally, events of the past decade and our reactions to them have delivered us to new insights, but so did did you hear that? Was any of that audible? We no. lost you for about uh, a minute or so, I think. Okay. Okay, I'll go. I'll go back to the paragraph starting for my friends. Sure. Uh, for my friends, however, coping with this challenge to my mortality asked of them something else. Anthea started emailing me, finding she could say <laughs> things on her screen that evaded her in person. In response, I too wrote what I failed to say out loud. Corresponding intermittently like this opened both us and the subject matter in unexpected ways. Since then, we have edited the emails into an epistolary poem, but it has not yet found a public home. Additionally, events of the past decade and our reactions to them have delivered to us new insights, but also more complex ones, which Anthea and I have begun to embody. And we do this separately and together. So for this project, two friends pick up their epistolary lifeline 10 years later to explore the weight of these insights. Our corporeal bodies, yes, but also our body of friendship and the body of work that we call writing. We intend to conclude this chapter with a reflection that troubles the vocabulary of mortality. So we'll read the 2011 piece we wrote. I have cancer, she said clearly strongly after a series of Mondays in which she went from a mammogram to a lumpectomy to a mastectomy and then was pronounced clean. I didn't want to disagree knowing it was part of the therapy, but I wanted to argue, how can you have cancer for three or four weeks? You don't know, you know. What do you know? They act like the US laying into Iraq and blasting every sand hill just in case. Your words. It's done. It's gone. The surgeon wipes his hands of the in situ cells. Is this cancer in 2011 or just the cleanest, kindest sort? How are you, they ask, not knowing, or quite possibly knowing very well. Fine, I reply, not knowing either or very possibly knowing all too well. For I knew all along in that place one knows without knowing that I knew. 
and then I add for clarity, fine, except for the cancer, which allows us both to laugh, which allows us both to feel better. There is at least one more chapter of Monday before my story, the public edition of my story can end. The next chapter of Monday is this Monday. This Monday, this mobile site of violence enlists with the new commander. This time, this one deploys chemical weapons where he, whether he does or whether he doesn't finger the button, cancer in 2011 amounts to warfare. The sand dune has been flattened and for now has lost all feeling. So it's impossible to say how clean the fight has been. I usually carry around my own two breasts unconsciously. I wash around and under them, I dry around and under them. I put on bras, take off bras, sometimes, oftentimes, readjust bras, often go without bras. Mostly I forget them. They cease to interest me at all. It's only when other perkier breasts are around me, as they sometimes often are, I remember that they peaked a long time ago. I haven't done mammograms. I used to do pap smears. I don't know how I got so willful about denying medical science the right to tell me what to do. And even now, when my friend has discovered there's a terrorist in her tit, I'm hopelessly ambivalent. Passing through. All flat now where once often wonder rose, so flat that out of the slaughter not even a dim outline survives in eye of mind, memory's home. Now across the flatland, hands untrained in looking fail to see new beauty and unheeding and unfeeling pass through shadows. Over, over the bump in life, over the lump of death. Death came close and receded, leered and breathed and threatened, altered perspective. On that day, we gathered in the windy garden, not quite summer and stormy, huddled against an old stone wall in the gap before, eating cakes with memory names, jokingly, provokingly. I looked across at you, being casual, being light, being with us, and I saw your death, or rather your death to us, the space between the Jill I had had, the Jill I now had, the person walking away from us, the person I couldn't weigh down with my shock and questions, the person walking into the blinding light, the trust of unconsciousness, the cut and the scarred resurrection. The drought ends in a squall, lines land on me, rain on blind ground. How could I not have seen? I live in your lines and out. I outlive your lines, and so I color inside the lines and out. The resurrection is complete, for now I live on. I live between the lines and through them. Turns out living's what I like. Resurrection following insurrection. In the shade cast by silence, resurrection felt its way, reached through my skin, drummed down my blood and skittled my bones. Then like a cowboy, it burst out laughing and spread daisies in my brain. <laughs> so, on to part two, 2021. Beautiful memorial. It is 10 years since I agreed to the removal of my right breast. Nine since the site of decimation was tattooed with an outburst of overblown lilies, those most ephemeral of flowers my nod towards flowers on a grave. The body that received the tattoo is not the body that now lives the tattoo, and the tattoo itself, now much faded, is no longer the image imprinted on my skin. I am telling you of this duality as a way of also telling you that when I think of what is written on my body, I think of what is written on our emails. I think, as art writer James Elkins does, that the creation of a form is also the creation of a body. Here we hold between us a form that is text, one that moves and slides and approaches and recedes, that works towards conjuring a body, mine, reminding two bodies, ours, that between us we are in possession of several bodies, while being itself a body. Here is a body of work we made, and we hold its life dear for reasons unclear but which we continue to seek. This body matters because it carries my new signature, this scar, which is long, thumb-tipped to fingertip of outstretched hand, and terribly neat. 
Every radiographer who sees it comments on the surgeon's handiwork. But the compliments I bask in belong to the mortal sin of vanity. Sometimes I will tweak a top to expose the lily's uppermost petals to court a compliment. And this elicits mixed feelings because for 50 years I kept my breast concealed from public view. Though it's true, the missing breast did attract its share of compliments too. How the lines land. We sit over my kitchen table with laptops, notebooks, and colored pens. You start to doodle, you write. This mortal body, you separate the words, this mortal body. You say this or that, body, embodied. I draw circles, I connect pieces of ideas, I color them. You photograph the page. As we think and work, I look for the original piece. It's called I have cancer, you say, so that I can search for it. I find it and I start to read it again. It strikes me how the responses to me land at a slant. They don't talk back directly. They acknowledge me, but they tell me different things from what I asked for. I remember the slight shock of reading these lines. Lines land on me, rain on blind ground. How could I not have seen? I live in your lines and out. I outlive your lines, and so I color inside the lines and out. I felt the small rebuke at the time. You are tra trying to lay your lines on me. You are trying to use your words to make me make it clear for you. Above all, you are trying to know me. I've spent a long time reading Johnny Steinberg's books and puzzling out his choice of protagonist, his choice of the man, always a man, other to him in every way. I work through his intensity of methods, his uncomfortable immersion in the other man's life. And I conclude that he wants to occupy the other person's interiority. It's true. I didn't like the cleanness of the cancer and I didn't like the messiness of the cancer. I did want to know. Above all, I really wanted to know what was going on inside your head, the decisions you were making, where did they come from? Now that I read the abstract, written one night when a thought struck you, I understand for the first time your family situation. It wasn't that you were terrified for your own life, as I rationalized then. It was that you considered your mother, who had faced so many losses and made a decision to save her further grief. You had to live. The excision. We offered the poem, the whole poem in two voices, to an editor putting together a volume of pieces that described feminist lives. We waited. She came back a while later to say she wanted precisely 11 lines. Excised from the whole, they were all my words. It would have been nice to have been in the anthology. The company was good. To help me make the decision, I read the entire piece to two writer companions to seek their guidance. I knew the original interchange was raw, that it lacked editing or finessing. But as I read, I watched their faces. When I finished, they were silent. It is raw, they said, and it should not be edited. I told the editor no, and you hugged me when you heard. You're not a hugger but it was the first time that I felt that I truly knew that this piece really mattered to both of us. Elkins again, and how I love him for this permission. The body is unencompassably strange and irretrievably unruly. I love it so much, I'm going to read it again, and also because Bronwyn used the word unruly and I heard the chime. The body is unencompassably strange and irretrievably unruly. This is why feminist editors aren't allowed to slash their way through it and take only the chunk that serves their literary purpose. There's only so much you can remove from a body with permission. If we were natals. We have been reading Grace Jensen, who picks apart the necrophilia of the Western moral imaginary. She finds that a preoccupation with death sits at the heart of the habitus we live in as white people with our roots in the Western way of thinking, doing, and being. Why else are we called mortals, the beings who are destined to die? Why else do we talk of mastery and overcoming? Why is our language so violent, our cultures so full of death dealing? Jan Jansen uses a psychoanalytic process to find out what is being repressed 
what is being feared and what is being desired in this moral imaginary with death at, at its center. The thing that is most denied and silenced is also the thing that gives this imaginary its power. So to look at the things silenced and denied. When a newborn human arrives in this world, it is powerless. It is fearless. It doesn't know to fear yet. It is completely dependent and probably on a woman first. It is at the mercy of its bodily needs, comfort, hunger, warmth. It cannot survive on its own. Whether it will survive is unpredictable. It is an embodiment of the tough fragility of life and a symbol of human dependency on the interconnectedness of the web of life. If we put those qualities at the center of our moral imaginary, rather than suppressing them, Jansen says, we would call ourselves natals rather than mortals. So how would things shift if we considered ourselves natals? To be constantly reborn, inhabiting fragile toughness? What is it I'm being born to? I reference Elkins again because he alerts me to the fundamental position of the human body and all we see. He states, the final source of visual meaning is the body. And I at once feel at home with visual artists as I reach towards representing my own body through these words, so that you, reader, might glimpse or even see this body alive to your eyes as you scan these lines. This mortal body is tautologous. If we are in possession of a body, we and it are mortal, and that's all there is to say about that. The alternative to inhabiting a mortal body, the circumstance common to us all, is to be in possession of a natal body. I find in Janssen's notion this conversation of a decade, its representations of our oppositional and evolving positions, my reach towards a self whose body I might recognize and come to love, and to a friendship between two women being born again and again because we seek again and again to be born to new relationships with our two bodies and with our writing. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Gillian and Anthea. That was an incredibly powerful presentation. Um, really appreciate that. Um, okay, we go on to Diana Bloom, who is going to be speaking to us about uh, nursing the female body language as scalpel. And Diana is um, doing a PhD at uh, University of the Western Cape. There's also a, a lecturer in English at uh, the Northwest University. So Diana, over to you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna jump right into it. And you will, um, as I go, I've written a paper and as I go, um, I hope everything will be clear to you. So, a nurse in the female poetic voice, the language is a scalpel. Since 1994, South African poets have made significant progress towards creating a body of work that is unique to South Africa. Scholars have written about the developments in South African poetry and also demonstrated a loose history of the transformation. Michael Chapman in Sequestered from the Winds of History, Poetry and Politics Beyond 2000, has provided an overview of the changes that poetry in South Africa has been preoccupied with since 2000. These changes are influenced by the political environment in the country. Poetry and politics, according to Chapman, gives rise to challenges, challenging questions that have no easy answers. More uneasiness within the art of writing has been highlighted by Sally Ann Murray. In her article, Lyric Language, SN, The Poetics of Contemporary Women's Poetry. In her article, Murray discusses the disorientation that many contemporary writers feel during the process of writing experimental poetry. She discusses how women writers defend their practice by using several non-normative genres this practice of defending one's work signposts an uneasiness with the reception of women's poetry. Murray uses error of the writer for the uneasiness felt by the audience. 
she also highlights that women's poetry has got minimal attention because the topic is contentious. As a woman engaging with writing experimental poetry, I find myself constrained by the lyric poetic norms. The norms that have originated from a patriarchal literary tradition, a tradition which can be dated back to ancient Rome, the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. And that, that I'm quoting Keller, Jonathan Keller. This constraint I feel does cause an erring, a doubtfulness and an easiness. Male voices have been at the forefront of the lyric considering the long history of the genre, which may, and I say this with some erring, leave the female poet in a position of uncertainty about what part of femaleness to write about. Deirdre Byron in her article, Still in the Fire, language as a theme and strategy in South African women's poetry has paid attention to South African women's poetry. She examines how South African women's, women poets use language to speak against colonial and patriarchal rule. In this article, she also notes, like Mary, the awkwardness that South African women poets are faced with during the creative process. The evident discomfort felt by South African women poets during practice has directed me to write the self-reflective essay on the need to nurse the female poetic voice and the way women poets represent the physiological reality of an easiness during their creative process. I will also attempt to resolve how women poets use language during practice and if this language usage collapses into the avant-garde movement of language poetry. During the self-reflective essay, I will be using the works of South African poets Koleke Putuma and Gabeba Badarun, American poet Lynn, oh, I spelled that wrong, Hinjinjin, Hinjinjin, sorry, my pronunciation of her surname catches me all the time, um, as well as my own poems. Nursing the female poetic voice. Nursing a voice during the creative process should not be likened to silencing it resulting in the female to desist from expressing discomfort. Nursing assists in healing, alleviates pain, and sometimes it provides a coping mechanism to live with sickness. The ill are nursed, mothers nurse babies and children, animals are nursed, and even material objects are nursed. They looked after. Nursing is about the process that treats and heals. In her poem, Grown Up Black and Woman, Patuma writes about wounds, pain and healing. I'm just gonna read you an extract from her poem. If our underwear drawers could speak, they would bleed, I tell you. Pillars would hemorrhage on our behalf. The unfortunate thing about healing is this. It convinces you that the pain is better than, than a scab. Scabs make people ask question, questions. X chromosomes make women, not men. The title of Kuleka's poem reflects the differences between men and women, and she uses women with an X, not an E. Kutuma associates um, speaking with bleeding. These underwear drawers are the speaking that are speaking, contain intimate knowledge of women. This unseen knowledge packed away in drawers tells us of, a, of the silence of women. The pillars that women cry into are injured from holding the tears. Women do not want to be questioned when they have been nursed back to health because closed wounds will, re, will be reopened. The female experience of hiding and keeping quiet are, as Rachel Blue Duplessis says, not separable, contingent or derisory but they have been vital to the historic practice of poetry. In my own writing, like Koleka, I speak of women of wounds. The poem I stain attempts to voice a woman's plight. She's outdoors, yet hardly able to steady herself. I'm going to read an extract from the poem. Apples locked into the corner of her eyes. Her left cheek slashed, red ribbons streamed her face as her left arm inflated, a form of a balloon. Blood stained the champagne pavers, the paper sandwich bag scattered. 
shift in her weight across to her right arm and steady like a newborn calf, she searched for his eyes. Gathering the empty sandwich bag, she found the dusk that had also fallen against the driveway instead of his eyes. This lack of balance creates a sense of uneasiness. A sandwich bag that is scattered is not intact and unable to provide nourishment and nurse in the body. This scene is evocative of the poetic female voice, which is scattered between the public, which is writing, and the private, consigned to pack in underwear drawers. As Blue Duplessis says, culturally and socially, we are still knotted loosely or tightly into the patriarchal. Women poets are still affected by the patriarchal physiological reality. Writing about a physical reality allows the female poet to move beyond patriarchal lyric discourse. Women poets are able to share a physiological place and move into their own space, departing from the uneasiness. To depart from the uneasiness means that the lyric convention becomes fluid and the poem is non-normative. Murray writes, awkward, awkward silence, perhaps since the African academic Demi is unused to quirky, non-normative genres. Heinjian is well known for writing non-normative experimental poetry. Her poem titled, She Showed the Left Profile the Good One in My Life and My Life in the 90s is depicative of the experimental. And it also highlights Heinjian's physiological reality of writing as a female. And I'm going to read your extract from this. At the time, I saw my life as a struggle against my fate. That is my personality. She was trapped in the eleva elevator, panting in plenty of air. Wounds by gossip's rat -a tattle More than horsework on war's hills. On a scroll in the case, the sequence of, the sequence of plum restless resembled stages in the development of the blooms on the snapdragons. They were driven indoors by the bees. Each time we entered the metro in Paris, I read the small sign which reserved the large face and double seat nearest the door for soldiers and veterans crippled by war. And it was just that small sign that realized for me the place name and its history. Writing maybe held it, separated there to see. In this poem, Hygiene speaks of being trapped and doing art in an elevator a confined space. She uses an extended metaphor of being indoors within a small space and a crowded space. For example, they were indoors and the metro are emblematic of restricted spaces. Heinjian speaks of being on a scroll, which reminds me of scrolling down the Word document and during, the writing process, and during this writing process, she speaks of what is happening to her. She notes that writing may have held and reflected her physical surroundings. This poem, as um, Blue Duplessis says, is mixing rubrics, both formal and social, the line, genre, and structural mingled with subjectivity and social location. In my own writing process, I seem to drop hints of a divided and uneasy physiological reality. Often I sit with an empty page or as in Arlene lives in a house, I have a dissociative space. And I'm gonna read your extract from this. Um, and she won't leave. She searches through the unpacked boxes. I'm unsure where she has come from. She dusts the empty photo frames. She calls my name as I fall asleep. She repeatedly talks about the black baby doll dress I wore last spring. And she won't sleep. At night, she wakes up. She wakes me up. She wakes me. I try and negotiate and sleep for a chat over morning coffee. She sprays the house for cockroaches, even after the pest control service have, have been. She leaves muddy footprints on the passage carpet after gardening and vacuums, vacuums at night when dinner is served. She screams when I want to leave the house. She screams about the chairs hurting her coccyx when she sits. And she won't use cushions because the fiber the fibers press into her skin. She puts hairpins in her bra, just in case she locks herself out of the house. She disappears when I stand in front of the bathroom mirror. Arlene, she calls as I leave the bathroom, but I know my name, I know my mother named me. 
As I reflect on this piece of writing, I'm aware of a physiological reality that is bare, without, empty photo frames. Yet the space draws attention to itself, having fibers press on my female body. My own practice presses me to explore experimental writing and to jostle with what I can do, write, and what I'm unable to do. Language or language poetry. At this point, the experimental practice and non-normative poems are evident of the divisions that are experienced by female poets. Lisa Sewell, in the introduction of 11 more American women poets in the 21st century, poetics across North America, notes that the range of poems written by female poets takes various forms and moves in numerous directions between genres, between genders, between bodies. Gebeba Baderun in her poem Shards is referential about practice. When you write poems, do you and this is an extract from her poem. When you write poems, do you, your word, do you words scroll precisely down a pristine screen? Or do you clear away strands of sounds like hair blown in your eyes? Sweep up the shards of the day. Note the stains on your shoes from the first fragile snowy flurry, snow flurry. The strands of sounds that are swept up in the shards of the day portray the female poet and the discomfort of writing a pristine poem. The writing process does not scroll smoothly. Shards embodies the non-normative writing practice. Women see the, the stains on their shoes. Shoes become stained from the grounds that are walked on. Elizabeth Nokia and Etienne Terre Blanche discuss a way Baderon depicts seemingly trivial and everyday events or experiences with acute attention to detail all of which are connected by her unique portrayal of their embodied nature. Henny Jin, in her poem, I've Never Seen Much That Was Typical, also portrays an embodied experience of the female poet. And I'm going to read you an extract from her poem. What is the is 50th year of my life now complete? Such a living life, such an inconstant one. Imagine the film equivalent of this one shot per sentence. The shot of this one of, then suddenly war broke through as I was typing something melodramatic involving an articulate. Cogs and rose for money from the radio of the floor behind me and my conscience departed from its place between my eyes and hands. My head is against a sculled and yellow wall. My toes have torn my socks. I eat something that's coming apart. I keep a light in case of tremor. I use a board and pass to mark my place. As for we who love to be astonished, we close our eyes so as to remain for a little while longer within the realm of the imaginary, the mind, so as to avoid having to recognize our utter separateness from each other, a separateness that is instantly recognizable in your familiar face. And in constant tells of the life that is filled with flux, the flux felt means I use a boarding pass to mark my place while creating. As a female poet, I recognize this flux, the private female roles, and time constraints during the writing process means I have one shot per sentence. My consciousness departing is leaving the eye of the lyric and crossing over to non-normative poetics. Being experimental means that female poets can come closer to reaching the realm that does highlight separateness. A writing practice that experimental through language is a collapse into the avant-garde avant -garde language poetry movement. Marjorie Perloff states that one of the cardinal principles, perhaps the cardinal principle of American language poetics has been the dismissal of voice as a foundational principle of the lyric of lyric poetry. And towards the end, I just have a, a section called drafts on reflection. Is my practice reflecting uneasiness and a need for nursing to find a realm of some collective voice that is moving away from the eye? 
the one eye. Women poets using experimental and non-normative poetics examine gender and the experience of being a female poet. As I write, I observe that gender, politics, and poetry merge during the process. Gender and the public-private divide and uneasiness is nursed when the physiological reality of the female poet is written into poems. Thank you. Sorry, I just had to unmute myself. Thank you very much, Diana. Um, really appreciated that. Um, and our last speaker for the session is Kirsten Dean, who is going to be uh, presenting on Rust. Um, Kirsten is a, is a postgraduate student at UWC, uh, working in creative writing, but she has in her biography uh, that you is in the, the handout you received, I think has uh, a wonderful formulation. She says, her writing is, in is intrigued by the idea of living and the different forms living comes in. She always intends to write honestly and bravely. And then my favorite, Kirsten's writing is focused on the present and all the limbs it grows day in and day out. Thank you, Kirsten. We look forward to, to hearing you. Thank you. Well, hi, guys. <laughs> um, so basically, my work for this presentation focuses on living with a physical disability and what this means, how you experience, you know, everyday experiences and what this means for the fact that you do have a disability. And it's not to create empathy, but rather just to show a different experience of life. Um, I'm going to start by sharing my screen. There's a podcast I listened to a few days ago with Julian Weiss and Ishmael Reed. Can you guys see it? Yes. Okay. So these are both poets that suffer from physical disabilities and illness. I'm just gonna let you guys listen to the first two minutes. Jazz survives because I saw Whit Marcellus do a D. Welcome to the Poetry Magazine podcast. I'm Lindsay Garbett. This week, I'm very excited to introduce this conversation between the cyborg Jillian Vaisa and Ishmael Reed. Reed is a writer whose decades of work have been immensely influential to Vaisa. They've shared stages and pages in their work as poets, performers, editors, and activists. They both wield humor and satire to seriously consider the violence of our governments, our literature, and the many other forms of erasure that are enacted on the lives and works of disabled people. Reed was born in Tennessee in 1938, and Visa was born in Texas in 1981. Across that 40-year age difference, they share a sort of poetic kinship. Their conversation today ranges from working across genres, smashing tokenism, and the joy of making up new words and new paths. You'll also hear each of them read from some of their recent work. Now, here's the cyborg Jillian Visa and Ishmael Reed. If there's a question here and you don't like it, just say pass and I'll just move on. I'm open to all questions. You're open to all questions, okay. All questions are good. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so here we go. Ishmael and I read together at the All Access Cafe with Tennessee Reed in Detroit. The All Access Cafe, for people who do not know, is a reading series for disabled writers and musicians founded by M.L. Liebler and supported by Marshall Mathers and Jack White. And Ishmael, you got on stage and you talked about how Egyptians revered disabled people mm -hmm. and certain tribes in Africa honored people with psychiatric disabilities. Mm -hmm. And then you mm -hmm. said to me and two disabled writers, and I'm quoting, you belong to a great tradition. And that was so huge, such a powerful thing to hear you say, probably because I don't always feel like I, as an openly, proudly disabled poet, belong in the poetry scene. 
Okay, so start off there. What caught my attention was his statement at the end, you know, saying as a poet and a writer who lives with a disability, she never felt as if she belonged. And for me, this raised the question of as individuals that have disabilities, how do we go about writing and how do we use language to incorporate our experiences of everyday life and how our physical bodies impact us. So yeah, so the title is Rest. I've included the simple definition of rest and I will explain why. So understanding the definition of rest, I asked myself, what happens to the insides of oneself when the outside is changing? From my experience of living with a disability, I understand that illness grows from the outside in. And by this, I mean, in this generation and in this world, we are forced to look at our physical bodies and to think of ourselves of just having this physical body. But once you look through it, you realize what I'm struggling with and my disability is rooted on the inside and it all comes from inside our physical form. And then when I arrive here, I ask myself, what happens to you when the inside of your body is aging faster than you are? How do you communicate with yourself, a self that has been dying? And what stories do you tell now? I'm interested in writing that does not necessarily answer these questions, but rather to explore the repercussions that a sick body has on the presence of life and how the individual experiences the medically aging body and what illness does to our everyday experiences and how this can be shown through language. The questions around the subject keep growing and so will the ways of writing about our inside. So what does it mean to have a sick or ill body? Let me just move this. Do you love it the same, if at all? And how does life look through this ill lens? Why are these questions important? What is often overlooked is the importance of the voice of our insides, particularly the insides we have that are sick in a way that cannot be seen. Physical disabilities on the outside are often taken into consideration more often than internal disabilities. To understand our bodies and to finally fit in them, we must crawl into these corners. This is how we give a voice to our parts before they disappear. We listen to their stories. As creators, we need to find and understand the need to know the effect of internal illness on the creative process. My work will reflect this effect. I intend to use language in a way that demonstrates or at least gives an idea of the inside workings of illness. Through images and interpretations of life through illnesses and disabilities, a creation of language for disabilities, if you will. Okay, RAS leaves us with a new layer. Something on top of the surface of the insides that reshapes what was there before. It is the illness that keeps us from understanding our insides. We need to communicate with and through the illness to create a sense of understanding of illness through literature. There is a poet, a brave poet, that I always felt that I always felt I shared a skin with. His work was ill, peculiar, brave, and full of nightmares. He only began writing in the later years of his life, the years in which he was sick. I talk about him in the present because his work brings me out of a lot of holes in me. And I find his writing, his writing process to be living on as we pay tribute to illnesses and physical disabilities. His name was Max Rispo. I'm gonna read one of his pieces. Um that I absolutely love. So it's called Cotexia. Today I woke up in my body and wasn't that body anymore. But more like my dog, for the most part, obedient, warming to me. When I slip at goldfish or toast, but it sheds, can't get past the simple sit, stay, turn over. How strange, but not entirely. This doesn't mean it's time to say goodbye. I've realized the enslavement. It's temporary and for my own good. My body's work is to break the world into bricks and sticks as to an image. As all the doors in the world grow heavy, 
a big white bed is being put in my heart. Sorry, it keeps moving on my side. Drippel's work goes inside his body, a body that at the time was living with cancer. And I say living because he began to breathe in a different way. We can see this in his writing through a peculiar way, yet straightforward images that he creates through language. Drippel's work explores how the sick inside body experiences the external world. And we can see this through the metaphors he has used. Like Drippel, I'm inspired to give the sick body, the sick inside of the sick inside the voice. It is important to understand the language of illness so we may hear where our illness, ill bodies want to be in this life and what they want to say. The voice of something sick or even dying shows us a different way of living. And is that not one of the big points of poetry? So I'm going to read two of my pieces for you guys. Um, this one is called Room. My door to leave, to go outside, was left open for too long. The locks have started to age, but let's call it resting. I'll only be 23 this year, and my life looks like this. I can give you an estimation of how many towels have been in my hotel rooms. The sad number is somewhere in my head. It must be there. At night, I feel an old man reaching down from the ceiling and sticking something in my arm. He smells like my medication. The towels are cracking in my bedrooms, red and yellow and brown. I'm sleeping in a scab. A scab is healing. My mother thinks the medication is working. I still feel the cold in, in too many corners. Rest will be left behind. I'll move on to the last one. Okay. This one's called this year. This time, I must say I'm sorry. I've been quite a bitch lately. Mood swings or stress, or maybe I'm just hungry. We never consider the nauseating taste, the insides of my mouth, you know them too. It's something like old blood. There must be a crushed cockroach in me. I smile too hard. In the Christmas picture this year, I could feel my skin thinning. I'm in the process of convincing myself. I've only started aging now. My head is always ringing. I can't tell time anymore. But rasping happens when you aren't looking at your insides. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kirsten. Um, a very powerful presentation again. Um, I would like them to open up for questions, please. Comments. Just need to switch to gallery view so I can see people. Can I please say something? <laughs> yes. Okay, Elana. Kirsten, that was so utterly beautiful and powerful, and I hope I get the chance to read it on paper because, wow, that, that's all I could feel. And you have that beautiful billowing curtain behind you. <laughs> That reminds me of that, not, not Crouching Tiger, but I think it's the follow-up. I don't know if you ever saw those Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Does anyone remember what the second one was called? And it focused so much on the life in the curtain and how that curtain was billowing and took you somewhere where you realized that there was life all around you. So thank you. I, I was very moved by that. And... For Gillian and Anthea, I really loved your parallel stories. I loved the two different voices that were really in parallel to each other and each had their own tone and their own style and their own things to recount. And it just put such a different spin on that experience. So thank you for that as well. And Diana, thank you for your very interesting presentation. Okay. Thanks, Alana. Uh,
I see there's a comment from Nandwe in the chat. It says, Gillian and Anthea, your reading reminded me of Anne Schuster's last collection, Even As It Thunders. Ah, thank you. I, I find it interesting that the work that Kirsten was reading was echoing with uh, Corvus's in the sense that you are not, that your body is becoming other, is becoming separate from you, from what you are. Uh, and I know I've said that I, I don't experience that. I think, I think I am my body. I'm nothing but my body. But I'm wondering whether disability has a different effect than illness. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not just wondering. I found, I found it an interesting uh, connection. I was, I was struck by that as well. Yeah, I had lots of thoughts about Kurbas going through my head as I was listening to Kirsten. Let go Kirsten, ahead, yeah. Kirsten reply first, and then I'll add some, and then I'll come in at at the end. Okay. Okay. So for me, I think what it is is disabilities and illnesses are very closely linked from my perspective. I think at first you see it as just this physical, external thing, but as you get older and you almost become more honest with yourself about your disability and where it comes from and what it means, you realize that it's rooted on the inside and there are times when it does feel solely like an illness and and that's how you you experience it. So I think it's just about the stages and the moments of every day, how you are connecting with it. it for me, it, it changes it changes every single day. There can be days when you feel like you, you're in your body in one way and then it's other days when you feel like you're not in your body at all. So, yeah, I think it's, it's definitely a up and down kind of thing. Thanks. Thanks, Kirsten. Um, I just think there's a particular, in Kirsten's talk, Kirsten, you, there's a phrase you used, which I think kind of sums up what you've just said at the end here now, to communicate with and through illness. And that phrase for me encapsulates the both and process of, at least for myself, writing about a body that is disabled from birth. Um, communicate with and through. So to communicate with, it's this communicating with that. So there is the this and the that, which is precisely what you were talking about, Ainki, the, the other, the body othered, this and that. But at the same time, which doesn't negate the this and that, at the same time, there is what, what Kirsten said, through to communicate with and also to communicate through illness. So to communicate through means to be within, inside, inhabiting, fully inhabiting and articulating. And that is for me the both and situation of at least my way of understanding my embodiment in a disabled body, that it is to be able to talk about it, I, I need to, I personally, speaking for nobody else, talk about it as something other, but to talk about that, I must talk about it through itself. So it, it's 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 a it's it's a real mind switch that I go through every single time I'm writing, because I am neither outside nor in nor I'm neither wholly outside nor wholly inside. I am both, um, and that's my only way of articulating and attempting to explain the. Uh, the experience. Uh, Philippa has a hand up, I see. Yeah, for, for me, it, I get a very strong sort of license from, from the way 
that you give voice to your existence, Kobus, because you are constantly in the on the edge of accepting and just allowing it to be. That you're just in the isness of it, and you're not expecting it to do any other work. And I feel like that it does so much work because you're so true to it. Like Helene was saying that to just be true to what it is, it's sometimes there are fewer words that come, but they are the true words, you know? Um, and I just, I just loved, I loved all of the presentations. Um, I also just wanted to say to Diana, perhaps, um, you might also like to just look at our words, our worlds, writing on Black South African women poets, where um, to, from 2000 to 2018, where um, there are a lot of sort of compositional, this compositional diversity where women are writing their stories. Um, and I just thought perhaps it would be interesting for your for your for your field that you're working in thank you thank you are there any more further questions or comments yes work um, i just have a just a little something that i was thinking of while jillian was talking about um, breast cancer and stuff i met um, I met a, a man over the weekend who had had breast cancer and he said it's it's actually very, very rare, but he'd had both removed and showed me scars and everything. I was actually quite quite astonished that that um, yeah that this 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 can occur as well. So it was, it was, it was actually spent quite a while chatting with him. He's he's not in that great a shape though, but um, but yeah, just in terms of bodies and things, that's that's quite interesting. Joanne has her hand raised. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Quentin. Joanne? Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, no, Anne, I just wanted to weigh in on this issue about disability and, and illness and how one experiences. I can't speak for illness, really, although the two do overlap sometimes, but I think um, speaking as a person with a disability, I think there's, there's so many subtleties in this. It, it, it really depends on, on a, lot of, uh, a, a lot of different factors, like, um, you know, if it's an acquired disability or, or, or if how long you've lived with a disability and, and so on, how, how you sort of embody that uh, disability. Um, and speaking for myself, I have never felt separated from it because I think one's sight is so intrinsic to one's being, like one's every second being, that I, I don't separate myself from it. But one way in which I am trying and wanting to write disability is to is to experience it with others. I, I can't say more than that, but uh, some kind of sense of solidarity. Thank you very much for that. Do we have any other questions or comments? Um, Nondwe has her hand raised. Thank you, Nondwe. Um, just the justification of my point about uh, Jillian and, um, and Anthea's um, uh, presentation. Uh, it reminds me of um, of Anne Schuster's work in terms of just how precarious life is when you are facing something like cancer. And yeah, I think that's why it reminded me of that collection because when she wrote it, she was going through cancer and she died before the collection was actually published. Um, so it in, in, in a lot of ways, some of the passages from your poetry kind of reminded me of the kind of tone that she uses. Um, so yeah, that was really interesting. Um, and Diana, I really wanna say something 
great about your presentation, but I can't think of it. Like it's in, it's like at the edge of my memory, but I just can't remember what I wanted to say. But yeah, great presentations overall. Thank you so much. Thanks, Nandwe. And, and interesting, I mean, that the notion of precarity does indeed emerge in, in this session and really fundamental to the idea of this mortal body. Are there any other comments, questions? Um, colleagues, then I need to be guided by you because we are actually now ahead of schedule. Um, we, our next session, uh, which Clovis is um, chairing, is due to start at 2.45. So, um, would you prefer simply to have a, say, a 20 minute break now and then start again at 20 past two? And so mm -hmm. finish a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. Is that a general agreement? Okay. Yes.